Over 10 years ago, the country's attention was focused on Terry Schiavo, a hospitalized woman whose life was ended supposedly for her own good, despite the wishes of her parents. Those kinds of incidents still continue. Just a week or so ago, a 69-year-old Boston-area woman suffered a similar death. Welcome to Wait Till You Hear This. I'm Steve Eastman. There are a number of differences between the cases of Beverly Finnegan and Terry Schiavo. If anything, Miss Finnegan had an even greater potential for recovery. Terry LaPointe has been covering the story for MedicalKidnap.com and HealthImpactNews.com. Terry, thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me on the show. It turns out the powers that be took advantage of a snowstorm to accelerate Miss Finnegan's death. But first, Terry, how about if you tell us how she got on the radar of the medical kidnappers? Believe it or not, I found out that they had been battling the system years before for their own mother, who had been taken and forced into a nursing home. So they have been actually fighting the system for a long time, and their mother passed away. So they were trying to kind of expose what was going on. The sisters were retired, living in a condo. They were not one to like allopathic medicine, the, the standard medical that they preferred to use, things like homeopathics and essential oils and herbal things, natural kinds of remedies. Right. Beverly Finnegan went to a doctor for, for something, and that doctor diagnosed a lung infection that she apparently never actually had. She had some things going on, but then she went and got somebody else. There, there was a conflict. That doctor did not like the fact that she didn't really take her word as gospel truth, the doctor's word as gospel, and sought out other medical treatment. So that doctor, in retaliation, wrote a letter saying that that she needed to be under medical care, and that if she didn't get medical care for this imaginary lung infection, that she would die within weeks or months because it was a long-term treatment and all of this. So the Adult Protective Services got involved, the courts got involved, and they sent out people to her house, and they did not want to let them in, but they broke in. Uh, did they have a warrant when they tried to get in the house? No, no court order, no warrant, which is very typical in these situations. Now, I thought we all had a right to a second medical opinion. Why was all the emphasis placed on the diagnosis of Dr. Ann McKinley and none given to the conclusions by Dr. Paul Byrne, who stated Miss Finnegan did not fulfill any set of brain death criteria? That's a really good question. It seems to be that the courts take the medical opinion of the doctor who fits their agenda. It seems to be a collusion. Someone has, a, in this case, a conservatorship that takes away all of her civil and human right to have any kind of autonomy for herself. That conservatorship, a guardianship, which is something that happens to senior citizens, more than we know, where a court will come in and, and somebody will decide, I want to be the guardian. So complete stranger will be the guardian and take away medical rights and the legal rights and the rights to autonomy and making decisions from an individual and then they will override any family members if they can get a court to agree and unfortunately there are courts that participate in this and will override any of an individual's wishes and those of their family. Something that really sounds suspicious to me is that Framington Union Hospital never treated Miss Finnegan for the original diagnosis, or for that matter, with a protocol advised by Dr. Byrne. What do you make of this? They had their agenda to get her into the nursing home. Once they got her into the nursing home, they said, oh, she's violent because she fought back against people that were taking her, that broke into her house and took her out of her house. And they said she was paranoid because she didn't trust doctors. Imagine that. They got her on all of these drugs. When they got Dr. Burns' medical opinion, it was completely ignored by anyone within that hospital, within that system. They said, well, he's a pediatrician. Well, he's also a pediatrician who's written half a dozen books and has got more articles than you can shake a stick at and has lectured at many, many places on brain death, on the issues surrounding end of 
underlying kinds of things and whether or not somebody is in a vegetated state or not. And he challenges many of the mindsets that says, oh, this person's brain dead, so therefore we just take them off of life support. He said that there were many things that they should have done when she was admitted to the hospital that they didn't do, and those things were things that literally ultimately resulted in her death. Miss Finnegan's on record as saying she wanted her sister, Janet Pitch, to make her medical decisions. Why was this ignored and her care turned over to the uh, guardian? There were people involved from what I'm getting from the family and from their attorney. There are people involved with the attorneys, the guardians, and the different entities involved that are all making money through this whole system. And if the sister is allowed to make the decisions and speak for her sister, then that little cottage industry kind of thing goes away. Well, it just sounds like a a bunch of corruption. I understand that Janet Pidge's attorney brought this matter to the attention of local police. What happened there? Nothing. She tried to get them to file a report, and they told her that it was a civil matter. Even though there's a wrongful death, the person died under very suspicious circumstances, that they said that this was not a police matter. Wow. I don't understand that. Well, let's get back to uh, where we started. What role did the recent Boston snowstorm play in Miss Finnegan's death? Janet had been at the hospital every single day. She didn't have transportation. She didn't have a car anymore. And Boston was shut down that day. A lot of the legal offices, a lot of the public transportation was just shut down because of the snowstorm and the flooding. It was an apocalyptic kind of episode for the city of Boston. And on that day, something happened where the next morning... They said, well, she's not going to survive more than an hour or so. So she took a turn for the work. And so somehow her condition that's been stable has been exactly the same for for many weeks. All of a sudden, on the day that her sister can't get there because of the snowstorm, takes a turn for the worse. There's a chance that it could be just a coincidence, but I'm not buying it. The rest of it certainly doesn't look that way. Terry, you're telling us a very scary story. But Massachusetts is just one state. Do you suppose something like this could happen in every state? Yes. Our focus mainly is on child protective services doing this, but every now and then we cover um, adult protective services kinds of stories, guardianship stories, and they do happen all over. We get requests to cover more of them, but we don't have the manpower to cover them. But they happen in many jurisdictions, in some places where people can just say, hey, I want to be a guardian. They go to a weekend seminar, and they can just find the list of people that don't have a lot of support or that, or maybe that have have a lot of money and family dysfunction, and then they can go in and overrule everybody in the family and take away a citizen's rights. Maybe that's what Janet Pitt should have done. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you were able to help us keep informed on this issue, keep it in the limelight today, Terry, and I'd like to thank you for talking with us today. All right, thank you so much for your time. Terry LaPointe writes for two great websites dealing with medical and related custody issues, medicalkidnap.com and healthimpactnews.com. This is Steve Eastman for Wait Till You Hear This. Discover more stories like this one on our website, waittillyouhearthis.com. 